Hello, everyone. I hope you guys are having a wonderful night so far and evening. Um, please join us uh, for songs today, right before uh, Q&A. Uh, please make sure that, you know, you're praising in a way where this is enjoyable to you as well. And so please join me. And um, I hope you guys uh, like this list that I have today. Uh, the first one is when the spirit of the Lord. Mm. When the spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will love as Jesus loves. When the spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will love as Jesus loves. I will love, I will love, I will love as Jesus loves. I will love, I will love, I will love as Jesus loves. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will pray as David prayed. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will pray as David prayed. I will pray, I will pray, I will pray as David prayed. I will pray, I will pray, I will pray as David when the spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will preach as Peter preached. When the spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will preach as Peter preached. I will preach, I will preach, I will preach as Peter preached. I will preach, I will preach, I will preach as Peter preached. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will serve as St. Paul served. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will serve as St. Paul served. I will serve, I will serve, I will serve as St. Paul served. I will serve, I will serve, I will serve as St. Paul served. Next song we're going to sing together is You Are My Hiding Place. You are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong. In the strength of the Lord, I will trust in you.
And the next song is going to be Shepherd of My Soul. <clears throat> Oh, you whose presence delights my soul, and who in my distress I call, my comfort by day and by night. My strong hope whenever I fall, shepherd of my soul, I beg you to tell where you Last song we're going to sing is Sons of God. Sons of God, hear his holy word. Gather around the table of the Lord. Eat his body, drink his blood, and we'll sing a song of love. Allelu, allelu, allelu. Alleluia, brothers, sisters, we are one, and our life has just begun. In the spirit we are young, we can live forever. Sons of God, hear his holy word, 
gather around the table of the Lord, eat his body, drink his blood, and we'll sing a song of love. Allelu, 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 alleluia. Shout together to the Lord who has promised our reward. Happiness a hundredfold and will live forever. Sons of God, hear his holy word. Gather around the table of the Lord. Eat his body, drink his blood, and we'll sing a song of love. Allelu, 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 alleluia. Jesus gave a new command that we love our fellow man till we reach the promised land where we'll live forever. Sons of God, hear his holy word. Gather around the table of the Lord. Eat his body, drink his blood, and we'll sing a song of love. Allelu, 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 alleluia. If we want to live with him, we must also die with him. Die to selfishness and sin, and we'll live forever. Sons of God, hear his holy word. Gather around the table of the Lord. Eat his body, drink his blood. And we'll sing a song of love. Allelu, 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 alleluia. Make the world a unity. Make all men one family. Till we meet the Trinity. And live with forever. Sons of God, hear his holy word. Gather around the table of the Lord. Eat his body, drink his blood, and we'll sing a song of love. Allelu, 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 alleluia. With the church we celebrate, Jesus coming, we await. So we'll make a holiday. So we'll live forever. Sons of God, hear his holy word. Gather around the table of the Lord. Eat his body, drink his blood. And we'll sing a song of love. Allelu, 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 alleluia. Thank you guys. And we're gonna go ahead and transition over to um, the Q and A with Father Matthias. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We ask for your blessing, and we ask, O oh Lord, that you always be with us, your children, and help us to see your presence in our lives every day. Through the prayers of St. Mary, Archangel Michael, St. Paul, St. Mark, and all your saints, hear us as we pray, thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
in Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, good evening, everybody. God willing, today we're going to continue our Q&A sessions. Um, uh, again, I encourage anyone who has a question to please use the form, uh, the Google submission form, to submit any questions you might have. Uh, the, the, the link to the form is here um, on the title slide. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The first question for today is, why do we sing veneration hymns to the saints? Uh, so, um, as, as you might know, we have many hymns in the church uh, where we are mentioning the saints specifically. Um, some are sung on certain special occasions, like when we have a revival <clears throat> and we have special veneration hymns that are sung during the Vespers uh, at night uh, that are specifically for the saints and St. Mary and so on. Um, but other than that, just on any regular service, we have uh, like a, a prayer called the Verses of the Symbols, which is chanted uh, in Matins and in Vespers where we are greeting the saints and we are remembering the saints. So, um, you know, a big source of confusion um, sometimes with people, especially those who are not Orthodox, when they see us mentioning the saints and they see us having icons and things in the church, um, some people assume that we are like worshiping the saints. Right? And then that's not true, of course. Um, worshiping is only for God. We only worship God. Veneration is a kind of uh, like honoring, just like we might honor certain people. Like actually, just if you're following in the news, there is a um, there is a member of the House of Representatives who is a very uh, famous, who, um, you know, has had a long career and he's, um, you know, he, he, he was 80 years old. He died recently and they're putting him, his, his body, um, like to be viewed like in the, in the U.S. Capitol, right? And so like people are coming to honor him, right? Because of his many years of service to the country and so on, right? So we, when we venerate, right, again, venerate means to regard with respect or to revere, like we are showing honor um, to the saints, right? And, and what is it that we are honoring them for? We're, we're honoring them for their deeds, like we're honoring them for what they have done. So many of the saints are uh, defenders of the faith. So for instance, someone like Saint Athanasius, he is a defender of the faith. Um, it is through his faith and his writings and his teaching that he was able to protect the church from falling into heresy, right? So we protect him. He's a defender of the church. Um, we honor those who are theologians, who has, have, have expounded, interpreted, and taught us the word of God, who are considered saints in the church. Um, we uh, honor the martyrs for the sacrifice that they have made um, for, for the faith that they're showing us, an example that they are showing to us in the way that they died for Christ. Uh, we honor the saints who... Um, show us a model to live by, right? Like people who who lived very ascetic lives, who lived very righteous lives, and they sought after holiness and righteousness, right? So we venerate saints um, just as we would honor someone of of like you know high honor that's alive in, in the in the world, right? There's no there's no difference, right? It's like having a ceremony in the honor of a great person that we are celebrating, and so as we are doing this. Um, the focus should be not just on, on the saints themselves, but on how is it that we can live like the saints, how we can emulate their lives. Now, maybe we're not going to emulate their lives exactly um, because we don't live in the same time and situation as they did. But in our modern day, how can we live the same faith that they had? What can we learn from them and that we can bring with us into our modern life? Which is why when we venerate the saints, that is what should be in our mind, like, what are these saints known for? What is it that I can learn from them? So it's important for us to, uh, to, to learn about the saints and, and what is it that they did. Um, another prayer that we pray um, in, the, in the raising of incense called the doxologies um, is a glorification of the saints. It's also a type of veneration. Um, and in, the, in that uh, doxology, it, it gives us a little bit of the story of the saint and what is it that the person was um, famous for and so on. But we can read in the Synexarian uh, about the stories of the saints and other resources to learn more about the saints. What is it that they have done? And so that when we venerate them, it's really a veneration that's coming from our heart. It's not just some kind of just like prayer that I've memorized or hymn that I've memorized. Um, but what we are uh, 
uh, you know, doing it like with understanding. Um, to that point also, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we have icons in the church is because we consider that the saints, the angels are actually praying with us, present with us in the church during the time of prayer. So it's like we are praying together, like the like we who are on the earth and those who are in heaven are united together as one church in the body of Christ and that we are praying together. Um, and, and so we are like greeting those members who are like with us in the church, just like, you know, when, when your friend or somebody walks into the church, you greet them. Um, here we are greeting the saints who are with us um, also in the church. So this is why we sing these veneration hymns to the saints, um, specifically um, the, the during periods of revival. So um, for some saints, um, usually like uh, if a church is named after uh, a specific, specific saint, uh, whenever the feast of that saint comes, the church can have something called a revival, which is essentially um, one or more uh, nights in the church where there is a Vespers that's prayed. Um, there is these special veneration hymns that are sung and melodies that are sung to the saint. And then there's also like a sermon or Bible study or something like that. And, and it's like a way of, it's called a revival. It's like a way of like getting people to come to the church and to focus um, on, on kind of the, the saint of their church and, and, and so on. Number two, why is the birth of Jesus only mentioned in two of the gospels? It was pretty, it was a pretty significant event. Shouldn't it have been mentioned in all of them? So um, it's important for us to, to like have an understanding of the four gospels and that the four gospel writers, they were addressing a different audience. Each of the four gospel writers were addressing a different audience and the gospels had like a different focus, okay? And each one wrote, um, and mention certain events that fit in with the audience that they are, uh, the audience that they are writing to. Okay, so um, it, it's it's when you when you get an understanding of that, right? Um, it gives you maybe more context into why the different gospels were written in different ways and the ways that they were written. Okay, so let me give you an example. Okay, um, so so the two gospels that mention the nativity of Christ were Matthew and Luke, okay, Matthew and Luke. So when you read Matthew, okay, so who was Matthew? Matthew was a Jew, okay, and his gospel was written to the Jews, okay, so he was focusing on the Jewish community when he was writing the gospel. It was intended for, for the Jews to be reading it, okay. This is why, for instance, he spoke a lot about um, things that connected to the Old Testament, you know, so, so, so there was an assumption that his audience understood the prophecies of the Old Testament, that they had learned all of this because this is where the, was their sacred, uh, sacred scripture, and that they were uh, like he, he was showing the fulfillment of these prophecies in the coming of the Messiah. Okay, because so many of the prophecies, the Psalms, and so on in the Old Testament were speaking about the coming of a Messiah, and that's why all of the Jewish people were waiting for this Messiah. So, so Matthew, okay, he, he assumed understanding of these prophecies. So when he speaks about the nativity, right, the nativity fulfills a lot of the prophecies of the Old Testament, and he's writing it to the Jews. The birth of Christ was um, in Israel, okay, the, 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 the homeland of the Jews, okay? So he mentions, he mentions the nativity there, okay? Let's look at Mark, okay? St. Mark... He wrote primarily to the Romans, okay? And the Romans, who were pagan, they were Gentile, they had no knowledge of prophecy or the Old Testament or, or any of those things. So the language that uh, St. Mark uses and the things that are mentioned by St. Mark in his gospel um, uh, are more focused on what would be appealing to someone who was Roman. So so, and what is that? So Romans, they understood power, like they, they were very powerful and they appreciated power. And so, for instance, when um, in the gospel of, of St. Mark, the very first miracle that is mentioned in Mark chapter one that Christ did is casting out of an unclean spirit, right? So this casting out of an unclean spirit 
like demonstrating like the power of, of God and the power of Christ, right? So he's not um, necessarily mentioning as the first miracle something that was, um, you know, like the wedding of Cain of Galilee or something else where it's like a miraculous, but but he's showing something that's showing like power, like like Christ is stronger than the demons, than the evil spirits. He's able to cast them out, okay? Um, here in this case, the, the birth of Christ is not as critical to mention because it's not emphasizing the like the the point or the theme of the book which is to demonstrate the power of god right to the romans so it's not it wasn't mentioned okay um luke okay luke was greek he's not jewish and he wrote to the greeks okay this is why you'll see that um, out of all of the gospels the gospel of luke is the most detailed okay because saint luke was a, a historian and he loved knowledge and the Greeks, they love knowledge and information. And so Luke put as much information um, and as much detail in the gospel because this is the audience he was writing to, right? And so he mentioned the nativity. He mentioned so many things, right? More things than um, in, in the other gospels, right? So a lot of times we'll find that um, when a story is recounted, let's say in, in two different gospels, the version that's recounted in Luke has additional details and information that wasn't necessarily included in the other gospel, okay? The last one is the gospel of St. John. So St. John, he wasn't writing to a specific group. He was writing to everybody, but his emphasis, so, so if, if the, there's a term that's used to describe Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the term is called the synoptic gospels. They're, they're called the synoptic gospels because they all have a similar feature in that they start at the beginning and they end at the end and they have, you know, they emphasize certain events and certain things that happen. And the structure of these gospels are pretty um, similar, you know, even though they don't include all the same details and everything, but they're pretty similar um, type of storytelling narrative um, from of the, the life of Christ. St. John's gospel is different. Okay, the, the, the point of this gospel was not in giving all the details and all the narratives and all the, the stories and the events and the things that happened in the life of Christ, but it was to show the divinity of Christ. And so the emphasis of the gospel of St. John is the divinity, right? And so the very beginning of the gospel of John starts with, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Why? Because it's emphasizing that the Son of God is eternal, right? It's, it's not focusing so much on the event of the nativity, because the nativity, which is the birth of Jesus, is not the, is not the beginning of God. It's not the beginning of the Son of God. The Son of God already preexisted from before, and that is the emphasis of the gospel of saint john okay so that's why saint john doesn't focus so much on the details of the incarnation he focuses more on the proofs of the divinity but he does mention it right in in, in verse 14 of chapter one it says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us but that's it you know he, he mentions that that the son of god the word was incarnate became flesh dwelt among us right so in that sense he mentions the nativity right? You could say, but he doesn't mention it in any detail. He doesn't talk about, you know, the manger. He doesn't talk about, um, you know, the annunciation or any of that stuff, okay? Because the focus is not on the facts and the, and the, uh, of, the, of the earthly life of, of, of Christ. It's more about the divine, the, the divine Lord and how he is, he is divine and preexistent before all ages, How often should you confess? Number three, okay? Um, so there isn't one specific answer to this question. Um, I usually recommend for people to have a regular confession schedule that's between one to two months, okay? More than this, I feel is, is not often enough. Um, and, and more than this sometimes is too often. Um, sometimes people in their zeal of wanting to confess um, they, they want to like confess every week or every two weeks, you know? Um, but I found that 
by giving people a chance to go out and live in the world, try to apply the things that we speak about during confession, then when you come back, you have some, um, some history, some experience with trying it. Like, so for instance, if, if in confession, um, I'm speaking to someone about um, how often to pray or how to overcome certain sin or so on, like go and try the things that we've talked about and then come back again and have another confession session that we can discuss. So I don't like to do it more often than every month, but if in some cases, you know, if there's special situation circumstances, then it's okay. Um, but, but typically every one to two months. And, and, the, and one thing about confession that makes a confession um, uh, more effective is during this period of time, keep like a running list of the things that you wanna discuss at the next confession, whether they be sins or other things that you wanna discuss, because then it will make the confession a lot more efficient and, um, and a lot more effective because you'll, you'll have in your mind exactly what you want to talk about. So confession is very important. Um, one to two months, I think, is, is a good amount. How or why do we use le'en water? Okay, so what is the le'en? Okay, the le'en is a word that means... Uh, or, or in English, we, we call it the liturgy of the waters, the liturgy of the waters. And it is a liturgy. It has the same kind of structure as a liturgy, but it's not, a, it's not like a liturgy for the Eucharist. It's not a liturgy where we take communion at the end. It's a, it's a liturgy where we pray um, on water and then the people are anointed with the water. Okay. And this prayer is prayed three times a year. Okay, the first one is on Covenant Thursday, okay, the, the day right before Good Friday. Um, the second one is on the Apostles' Feast, okay, which is July 12th. And then the third is on the Theophany Feast, okay? So, so why do we pray the Liturgy of the Waters on these three occasions? Okay, so for the Theophany Feast, right, the Theophany is commemorating the baptism of Christ. So we are remembering like the sanctifying work of the water, right? In um, that, that God has made for our baptism that we are celebrating in the Feast of the Theophany, right? So we are commemorating the use of this water in the baptism of the Lord. And so here on this um, prayer, we will pray the Liturgy of the Waters, okay? And the Liturgy of the Waters, when it's prayed, if any of you have attended the Liturgy of the Waters, it's typically prayed at the back of the church, Okay, so, so we set up like a table with a basin of water um, in the back part of the church, and we pray it in the back of the church, not in the front. Okay, why do we do this? Historically in the church, uh, the baptismal font would be located in that place in the church, would be placed, would be in that part of the church. So, so we, we, we kind of, to remember the, the, the work of the baptism and the water and the work of uh, the work of the water and baptism. We do the prayer in the back of the church where historically this baptismal font was. And we know that even now, even though the baptismal font is not exactly in that place in the church, but the baptismal font is in the back of the church um, and, and behind the nave. OK, so uh, so this is why we do it there. After the, the prayer uh, of the Liturgy of the Waters for the Theophany Feast, the priest will uh, take uh, like a towel and he will wet the towel with the water and then he will anoint the foreheads and sometimes the wrists of all of the people in the church. Okay. That's the first occasion where we pray the Theophany Feast. Uh, sorry, where we pray the Liturgy of the Water. The second occasion where we pray the Liturgy of the Water is the Covenant Thursday. Okay. Why do we do that? Okay. Does anyone want to guess why we do uh Covenant Thursday. What, what, what is what is what is related to water in Covenant Thursday? Do you want to wager a guess? Yes, washing the feet. Okay. So, what is washing the feet? Christ washed the feet of the apostles. Okay. Christ washed the feet of the apostles on Covenant Thursday. So we are commemorating the washing of the feet. Uh, when Christ washed the feet, and we are remembering also that Christ called us to wash one another's, one another, another's feet, meaning that we serve one another, right? That we place other people before ourselves. In John 13, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands 
and he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Okay. So um, in the Theophany Feast, Liturgy of the Waters, after the, the liturgy is done, Liturgy of the Waters is done, the priest will take the towel and he will anoint the forehead and the feet and the, 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 the wrists of the people. Okay. Covenant Thursday is different because we are commemorating the washing of feet. So, and, and it says here that Christ girded himself, meaning he took a towel and he tied the towel around himself. And then he sat on the ground and he washed the feet of the disciples. Okay. So for this reason, because the priest represents Christ in the church, after the liturgy of the waters is done on Covenant Thursday, the priest will do the same thing. We'll, we'll tie a towel around his waist, sit on the ground. And in this case, he will wash the feet of the men. So the men will come up and lift up their pants and, and he will just wash their shins, like, like washing their feet, uh, essentially making the sign of the cross on them with the towel, with the wet towel. Um, for the women, he will do their foreheads. So he just doesn't do their feet. But for the men, he will do um, their feet. Okay. Um, for the apostles' feast, okay, then why is it that we do this? Okay. So we read in the book, um, the book called The Canon of the Apostles. Okay, this was one of the books that was written by St. Clement of Rome, and it was part of a collection in the 4th century. Okay, so this is what it says. It says, they continue to speak in the new tongues of the nations. This is about speaking about the apostles, in which they preached. And he told them what must be done by the congregation with regards to prayer, worship, and the laws. And they thank God for this knowledge they received. They fasted for 40 days thanking God through it. And then Peter washed the feet of the disciples. Then they all departed to all the nations to call people to the faith. Okay. So what is this speaking about? This is recalling that after, okay, they, the apostles fasted for 40 days. This is why, this is why we have the apostles fast. Okay. After they, they fasted for 40 days, at that point, Peter washed the feet of the disciples and then all of the disciples went out to uh, preach to the, to the nations that they had been called to preach to. Okay. So, so we are commemorating here in the Apostles' Feast this time where all the apostles go out to the world to preach. And that this began with this act of the washing of the feet. Okay. So we also commemorate this. And we have another liturgy of the waters that we pray here um, at this time. And uh, again, the priest will wash the feet, right? Just like we did in the Covenant Thursday, because that's what St. Peter did, but does not gird himself with a towel in this case, because the, the girding of the towel is only done on Covenant Thursday, because this is what it said that Christ girded himself with a towel. On the Apostles' Feast, we use the towel to wash the feet, but we don't tie the, the priest doesn't tie the towel around his waist, okay? Um, one other interesting thing about this that I learned actually last year, okay, so um, last year His Grace Bishop Yusuf was, uh, was with us praying um, on the Feast of the Theophany. And um, the bishop, of course, he is the highest rank in the church. So nobody blesses the bishop. Nobody does anything like the bishop is the one who blesses the people, okay? So, so I was surprised actually when His Grace asked me at the end of the Liturgy of the Waters to anoint him with the waters of the Liturgy of the Waters, because that's usually never done. What would be done is that the bishop would anoint the priest, right? Because he is like, he is the highest rank, right? So, so if, the, if the bishop is present, the bishop is the one who will wash the feet of the people, right? Including the priest. But in this case, the bishop, he asked me to do it. And I asked him why it was the case. And he said, because in the Theophany Feast, we are commemorating the baptism of the Lord, Right. So the Lord, obviously, he is the highest rank. St. John the Baptist baptized the Lord. Right. So in this sense, the priest is like anointing the bishop in the same way that St. John the Baptist baptized the Lord. So I thought that was a really interesting thing. I had never, never heard of that before. So what was done then with this water? So this water is not a sacrament. OK, this is not a sacrament. It's different than 
you know, any of the sacraments like communion and so on. This is a blessing, right? This water is a blessing. We can drink the water. We can anoint ourselves with the water. Some people cook with the water, you know, um, and, 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 and we take it home with us. Some people will bring their own water and, and, and put it there under the table when the priest is praying and, and the water gets blessed so that they can take it home um, with them. So it's seen as a blessing. It's not sacramental. You don't have to be fasting to attend the end, the liturgy of the waters, because it is, it is not a sacrament. Number five. Little, uh, little kids sometimes are asked by their friends to share their toys, but they don't always accept sharing. When that happens, I struggle to know how to properly deal with it. When should I encourage the kids to share? And when should I just respect that they don't want to share something of their personal things, which we as adults sometimes do for different reasons? Okay, so we all know that teaching children to share is very important because by our nature, when we are born, we are very selfish. We are self-centered. We look only for our own things. We care only for our own things. We feel that we are the center of the world and that everyone around us has to serve us because, well, we are very helpless, so we need to be served, right? And so, so from a very young age, children have a sense of um, that they are the most important people, right? Like, I am the most important. So we are trying to teach our children to get out of that, to not see themselves that way, to actually follow the command of the gospel. So Christ said, or St. Paul said in Philippians, he said, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Okay, let each esteem others better than himself. So to teach selflessness, one of the ways that we teach selflessness, and one of the ways that we practice selflessness, is that we give of the things that are important to us, that are valuable to us, to others who are in need. So for instance, tithing, we are taking something that's valuable that we have and we're giving it to others, right? Sharing of our time, sharing of our energy, sharing of anything that is ours, it's something valuable to us and we need to learn so that we give of those things to other people who are in need and this is fulfilling the gospel and the law of love, okay? So we need to teach children this and one of the ways that we do this is we tell children that they need to share their things, right? Because their toys, their things are very important to them and they feel a strong attachment to those things. So we tell them, you must learn to share. Don't be greedy. Don't hoard things to yourself. You know, don't be, think that you are the only one that's important. Share of what you have, right? You receive this, like, you know, we, we, we also want to teach them that they receive this as a gift from us as their parents. So they shouldn't hoard onto it and to keep it only to themselves where they need to share it with others. Just like God said, there is nothing that we receive, didn't receive from the Lord, right? So also we should be, you know, we should be able to part with the things that we have easily, right? We should be able to give it away easily, okay? We also teach them things like not putting themselves first. Like for instance, don't be always the first person to stand in line and to get to make your decision before others. Don't be the first one to serve food first wait for others, you know, this is all things that we do to try to teach children this principle of giving up of themselves, of putting themselves last, of being selfless and not being selfish, okay? Um, at the same time that this is true, okay, we need to exercise discernment in applying this principle, okay? Because, for instance, we as adults are also supposed to share, right? You know, we, but we have boundaries and limits, to what we give. So for instance, you know, I, I have my car and, you know, if I'm so what we give, right? There's, there's, there's discernment and limits and boundaries. I only have the one car and I need that one car in order to drive around. Then to, 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 to say no to giving away that car is not. We should apply the same kind of principle when we're asking our kids. So for instance, what are some reasons why I might not want other people to share in what I have. Maybe you're going to use it in a way that's inappropriate. Maybe you will harm yourself somehow by stuffed animal and they see it as a source of security. They see it as a source, like a companion, like a friend almost. Maybe as adults, we look at that and boy, that has such like a strong, 
like um, emotional value to the crossing the line. Maybe that's, that's actually impinging on that child's boundaries by forcing them to give away something that's so important to them, because that is a very unique thing. It's not child um, to give away, or maybe um, the person who, you know, if I tell my child to uh, share with another child and everything that they touch ends up getting torn apart, ripped, destroyed. So essentially, if I essentially going to say that that toy is going to guarantee to be broken and destroyed. Well, no, I'm not going to tell them to share then because the goal of sharing is not just to share. The goal of sharing is to break selfishness, but also, right? Like I, I have to learn both things. So I can't override like their, their personhood by forcing them to share things that is, is, is unreasonable or two people who I shouldn't, but at the same time, I should, I should, I should break the selfishness. I should make them feel like, yes, out of your, out of your abundance, you know, out of your abundance, give, right. But if, if there's something for one reason or the other, that might not be the best uh, idea to, to share that I don't have to tell them to share um, those things. So it's like, like in everything, it's like finding a balance, right? Between teaching selflessness and at the same time, maintaining boundaries um, with the children. So this requires discernment from the parents. Also, it requires listening to our children, right? Like for instance, if I tell my child to share something and they say, no, I don't want to share. We talk to them and say, why? Why don't you want to share? What do you think is going to happen when you share? Listen to their concerns, right? Are they afraid of something? Are they afraid the toy is going to break? Are they going to afraid it's going to get lost? Are they going to afraid, you know, listen. And then based on what they say, we can then make it, make a judgment like, okay, in this situation, does it make sense for them to have to share or not? Okay. So, so, you know, it's important for us to always be communicating with our kids and that to know that like, like too much of a good thing isn't necessarily good, right? We have to, we have to have that discernment. Uh, number six, do the dress code guidelines that the church gives apply uh, outside of the church, even in places like the beach? Okay, so um, we have to understand what is the purpose of clothing and what, why do we wear certain kinds of clothes? Okay, so the first and obvious reason why we wear clothes is to cover our bodies for modesty, right? Adam and Eve, um, immediately after the fall, they felt naked and they felt a need to cover themselves. And so they went and they covered themselves. Okay. Um, so, so that's number one. Two, another reason that people wear certain kinds of clothes is to express an opinion, right? You might have people who um, there are certain messages that are written, certain words that are written on, on clothes and people identify with those words. They identify with those opinions. And so when they wear those clothes, they are like sending a message to other people saying, this is what I identify with. This is what I believe. Okay. Just like when we wear like a cross, for instance, without saying anything, we are wearing that garment of clothing. If you want to call it clothing that, that communicates something right to other people around me, for instance, a priest clothes, right. It says something about who this person is, that this person is a Christian priest. This person is an Orthodox priest. Right. Um, so even the style of clothes, right, can communicate belonging to a group that wears similar clothing. So if you have like, for instance, a military uniform, military uniform, I know means that this person is in the military and, and, and believes in the ideals of the military, the values of the military, because they're wearing the clothes of the military. Certainly also you might have people who wear clothes that are affiliated with being in a gang. Right. That even though they are just clothes even though they are just pants, but the way you wear your pants might communicate something about the kind of group of people that you affiliate with and the belief system of that group. So when we, when we, when we see someone maybe wearing a certain kind of clothes, right? It's not just about the clothes. It's not just about the, the cloth that the clothes are made of or the way that they're worn, but there is meaning behind those things and there's reason why I wear those things this is because I might want to be affiliated with a, a group that has a certain value system, a certain belief system. Okay. So that's the second purpose for clothing is that it communicates something about myself, about what I believe. A third uh, purpose for clothing 
is a utilitarian purpose, like a functional purpose. Like, for instance, I wear certain clothes because it makes it makes something easier. So, for instance, um, like at the beach, someone would wear a bathing suit because because that's the appropriate kind of clothes for swimming. You wouldn't wear a suit or you know like 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 a, a tuxedo to go to the beach because that's just not appropriate for the setting, right? It's not functional, right? Um, you wear pajamas for sleeping because they're very comfortable, but that doesn't mean that that is functionally going to work if you're a construction worker, right? Construction where you have to wear different kind of clothes because functionally you need that. In a business setting, which is more formal, you need to wear formal clothes, right? So each of these types of clothes serves a purpose according to the activity, okay? So what are the three reasons we talked about? Clothes serve multiple purposes. Number one, for modesty, to cover ourselves. Number two, to express an opinion or a point of view. Three, for some functional purpose, okay? That's, those are the three reasons we said. So in the church, okay, when the church puts a dress code, okay, what is the purpose of that dress code, okay? Well, we look at the three. Number one, physically cover our bodies, okay? Yes, we have to physically cover our bodies. And, and, and especially when we are promoting the idea of modesty, of protecting other people from lust, of you know covering myself this is the christian uh modesty right so the the church dress code is going to say that you should cover yourself and wear clothes that is not uh, arousing to anyone that is not drawing attention to yourself attracting other people to yourself and so on right and and that uh that function of the dress code is something that would apply everywhere right everywhere you should be have a moral modest dress, right? It has nothing to do with whether you are in the church or not. It should be modest. It should not be attracting attention to yourself. Okay? So that's the first one. Second, to express an opinion. Okay? Sometimes people will come to church wearing a shirt that expresses, that has words written on it. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with those words. There's nothing like cursing or insult in those words. But what does it do is it brings the messages and the ideas of the world into the church. The, the, the purpose of, or the, the, the thing that we need to be doing in the church is focusing on God when we pray, right? And so that all of my mind, all of my thoughts, everything is directed to God and in prayer. But when I see around me a lot of messages, a lot of messages, shirts that say different things or, 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 you know, whatever, or styles of clothing that remind me of things in the world that have certain messages portrayed. So, so that is a distraction, right? It's better not to come to church wearing clothes that have those messages on them, because even if the messages themselves are not wrong or bad, it's not the right venue. It's not the right place for us to be thinking about those messages. I'm not coming to church to advertise. I'm not coming to church to tell people this is what I think about some issue. No, I'm coming to church to worship God. If I have a desire to communicate those messages, I can do so outside of church, right? But church is not the place for that, okay? So um, similarly, like wearing shorts, right, in the church, right, is not appropriate. Why? Because shorts are indicating a very relaxed, informal attitude, right? I wear shorts in a place that's it's very informal, like on a vacation. Okay, that's where I wear shorts. I wear shorts to play sports. I wear shorts like to do something that's not, you know, like when we, when we, when we pray worship God in fear and trembling, I don't imagine a picture of somebody worshiping God in fear and trembling while they're wearing shorts. It's just not the appropriate clothing for worship, right? If, if we wear like very fancy clothes to go to important events, um, to go to work, to go to expensive places that are very, you know, high scale, high end, right? Then I should do so also in church because I'm coming to meet with, with the Lord, right? I'm not, I'm not coming to, to, to just relax and like play games, right? That's why we shouldn't wear uh, shorts in the church. But that doesn't mean that shorts are wrong. It doesn't mean that shorts, it's sinful to wear shorts. You can wear shorts in other places according to what it is. But Again, like I said before, without with, with the with the caveat that we are not that we are being modest, that we are not attracting attention to ourselves, and so on. So I guess the the you know when deciding what it is that I should wear, okay, um, I should ask myself: number one, 
does it attract unnecessary attention to myself? And will it be a distraction in the place that I'm going? Right? Does it attract unnecessary attention to myself? Two, is it morally acceptable? Right? Will I be causing other people to stumble because of my dress? Okay. Three, does it send a message that I want to send? Is it appropriate for me to send that message in the place that I'm going? Okay. Four, does it affiliate me with other people or groups, right, that have a certain value system that I want to promote, right? So uh, uh, am, I, am I wanting to promote that? Am I wanting to tell the people that I am with, I promote this value system, okay? Um, does it fit the place that I am going, okay? So all these questions we can ask ourselves. So the idea of a dress code in the church is made up of, number one, modesty, and number two, what is appropriate for worshiping God, okay, in that place. So back to the original question, okay, that it says, do the dress code guidelines that the church gives apply to outside the church, even in places like the beach? Well, yes and no. Modesty applies everywhere. There is no place where modesty doesn't apply because that is, that is what God wants us to be. He wants us to be modest and moral at all times, okay? But when it comes to the type of clothes, like wearing shorts, for instance, there's nothing wrong with that, but you wouldn't do that in the, in the church, but you could do that on the beach. Okay. So, so there's, there's, there's wearing clothes that have certain words on them might be fine at the beach might be fine in other places, but not in the church. Okay. Because the purpose and the focus of the church is, is different than in other places. Number seven. There is a verse in Exodus 20, verse 7, that says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What does that mean? Okay, so this is the third commandment. Exodus 20 lists the Ten Commandments when God gave the, uh, the tablets, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments to Moses. So I'm going to read the whole verse. The verse says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay, so what does it mean to take the name of the Lord in vain? When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, in the Our Father Prayer, we say, hallowed be your name. Hallowed. Hallowed means revered and honored is the name of God, right? In Philippians uh, chapter 2, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So this is the power of the name of Jesus. The, there's power in that name. Jesus said, anything that we ask the Father in his name, we will receive. There is power in his name. That, that simply at the mention of his name, it's like every single person should bow down and worship, okay? Because, because this, is, this is God, right? This is, again, worship God in fear and trembling, okay? So when we take the name of God, when we take the name of Jesus, and instead of using it for the purpose of worship, instead of using it to identify with God and worshiping God and, and praying to God and using it to mean God, right? When we use the name for any other purpose, this is using his name in vain. This is blaspheming the name of God, okay? Because the name of God is powerful, because the name of God is honored, because the name of God should be worshipped, okay? So we shouldn't use his name for any other purpose. So I'll give you an example. When, you know, there's many times where, you know, we are surprised about something and somebody says, oh my God, like that, okay? So what do we really mean when we say that? Do we really mean that we are like asking God in a prayer to protect us from something, to do something? Are we, are we, are we really referring to God as really he is God? Or are we just, it's just kind of an idle phrase. It's a, somehow we learned it. Somehow society has picked it up over time and people just say it. Well, people who are maybe atheists, <laughs> people who maybe don't believe in God at all. People who hate God might say that, right? Um, people are not really calling on God, but what it does is it dilutes the name. It dilutes the meaning of his name. It dilutes that God is not some transcendent, greater divine being. No, he's just a word. 
He's just a word that we use that we say, you know, whenever I, 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 you know, I stub my toe, I might say it. Whenever my friend tells me something really uh, uh, shocking, I might say it when, you know, whatever, or, 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 or the name of Jesus. Like we, we hear maybe a lot of people, like whenever they're just frustrated or angry, they just might say the name of Jesus, right? Like, like in a, in a, in a, in a, in a like a mocking way, like an angry way, like not really asking Jesus for help in anything, not praying to Jesus, and certainly not at the name of Jesus, every knee bows in heaven on earth and under the earth, right? So, um, you know, when you look at like the, the Jews, right, how they revered the name of God, they do not even utter the name of God, nor they even write the name of God down, right? So in English, whenever you see like a Jewish person write the name of God, they write G-D. They don't even write it all out as G-O-D, right? Because that is how holy they see it, as it is beyond uttering, it is beyond writing, right? Um, because that's how important it is, right? So, so this is what it means. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, because his name should elicit worship, awe, reverence, prayer. Like, like his name should be honored above every name, right? And that's what? That's what it means. Number eight, if we only repent and never confess, will that mean that we are not forgiven by God because we never confessed? Oh, sorry. Somebody said what? I heard a Jewish scholar saying that, that the verse is supposed to be translated to not take the name of God in vain as in not to commit evil in the name of God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that could be as well, because that's, that's saying that we are, um, like, we are associating evil with God, okay? But the name of God himself, right? The name of God himself is, is to be revered. Um, sorry, if we only repent and never confess, will that mean that we are not forgiven by God because we never confess? So I'm going to read for you verses from the Bible, okay, about this. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay. Leviticus 5, 5. And it shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. Okay. Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. John 20, receive the Holy, this is now he's got, Christ is speaking to the apostles. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Okay, so there are many verses in the scripture that speak about confession and that we need to declare and to confess the sins that we have committed. Okay. And specifically when Christ gave the gift of the priesthood to the apostles, he told them, you, if you forgive the sins, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins, they are retained. Okay. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the apostles are like, like the ones doing the forgiving. God is the one doing the forgiving because the sin is against God, right? But God has given the apostles the, the, the gift, the ability to absolve the sin of the people. So it is through the gift of confession, through the sacrament of confession, that God forgives the sin, okay? So it's clear that God tells us many times in scripture that we must confess sin. And it's clear that he gave us the means to confess sin through the priesthood. Okay. Because that's what he said. What happens if someone does not confess in Proverbs 28, 13, it says he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Right. If he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Okay. So, so it's clear that confession is extremely important, right? It, the sacrament is called the sacrament of repentance and confession because repentance is the first step, right? To repent of my sin. 
And then confession is the second step. Some people will ask or like in the question, so, you know, how legalistic do we take this? Okay, so like, let's say somebody is very repentant of a sin and they died before they had a chance to go and confess it to their father of confession. What will happen? Does that mean that God is going to hold it against them? No, we are not saying that God is legalistic like this. He, he, he looks at the intention of the heart, right? But even if I have good intention, and even if I am, am truly repentant in my heart, still the idea that we must go to confess is clear. It's clear from these verses. It's, it's, it's clear from the tradition and the church from the very beginning, right? Of what the church practiced. And the confession actually, long ago, the confession would be in front of the entire congregation. So when someone would sin, they would come and stand before the entire congregation and they would declare their sin in front of everybody. So thank God that it's not like that anymore. Okay. But clearly Christ gave this gift to the apostles for a reason. There's no way that the apostles could forgive or retain sin unless people came and confessed the sin and came and told them their sins so that then they would do this. Right. So this is an important sacrament that we should all be practicing and I really recommend to everyone, if you do not have a father of confession, to, to find one. Okay, this is the last question for today. Jesus taught us to pray, may your will be done. Shouldn't our prayers be to ask God to help us be in peace with his will, rather than making specific requests that might not be his will? Okay, so number one, we know that God's way is perfect. Right, Because in 2 Samuel 22, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word is of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. So what does this mean? It means that God's will is perfect. Okay, God's will is perfect. But God also asks us to pray. And he, asks, he tells us to ask him for what we desire. In Mark 11, 24, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. You know, knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will find. Okay, so we are called to pray. And actually, even in the liturgy, right, we pray for things. Like, for instance, in the litany of the sick, what do we pray for? We ask that God heal those who are sick. Well, we could say, well, what's the point of praying that? If, if it's God's will that sick people will be healed, then sick people will be healed. Why should I even pray for it? We ask for um, the departed people, right? That God would, would, would repose their soul. Why do, we ask, why do we pray? If God wants to repose their soul, he will repose their soul. Why do we even ask for him, for, for him to do that at all? We, uh, we pray for the leaders. Um, we, we pray for the weather, the agriculture. We pray for all these different things. Why? Why are those prayers even there? On, on a personal level, we pray that God would help us know who to marry, where to live, what job to take, like all these things. We're asking for, for God's like, like guidance. We're asking for God to help us in different ways. Okay. Um, Christ himself, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, ready to go to the cross, he prayed to the father and he said, father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Okay, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And this is the right approach to prayer. When we have something very troubling and bothering us in our life, yes, we can ask God for it. We can ask God, take this away as it is your will. Okay, as it is your will, take this away from me. I want you to take this away from me, but only if it's good for me, right? If, if, if the thing that I'm asking for is not good, because remember we said, as for God, his way is perfect. So if the thing I am asking is not good, I do not want it. But I am asking it that, that this is my desire. This is what I hope for, but deny it to me if it is not good for me, right? And so this is how we should be praying to God. But we see that God moves. God moves as a result of prayer and as a result of like, like something that we do, like the, the Ninevites, when, when they repented, God relented from, from destroying them, right? The actions of, of, of human beings 
changed what God was going to do because God said that he was going to destroy them. He, he, he said he was going to destroy them without any qualification. He didn't say unless. He just said, in 40 days, this great city, Nineveh, will be destroyed. But it's because the people believed, had faith, repented, and then God relented from doing what he had said he would do. Okay? So, so we see examples of intercessory prayer, right? Intercessory prayer that God hears and he takes action. Of course, all of this should be in the context of God's will. But there is more than one kind of will of God. There's God's perfect will, right? There's God's permissive will. God allows certain things to happen, even though it's not necessarily what he would have chosen, right? God allows sin in the world. He's permitting it to be in the world. But this isn't what God would have wanted, right? But he, he allowed it. So God gives room and flexibility, right? Not everything is like defined. Not everything is, is so like um, rigidly determined to where everything is just going to play out in a certain way according to what is in the mind of God and that's it. No, God allows freedom, true freedom in us to ask for certain things, to do certain things, to take certain actions and that God takes these things into account. Of course, God knows in the end what's going to happen and what we're going to choose and, and what will be. But that doesn't mean that he controls it. Doesn't mean that he, he makes it all to be exactly so. He gives us all freedom. And part of that freedom is asking God for our desire. And, and, and God will, will answer. God can answer prayer. God can change things as a result of prayer. Right? So, so we should pray. But our, 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 um, our, our desire should be that whatever I pray, that God would answer it only if it is good for me, if, only if it is right, even, even only if it is the will of God, right? Like imagine from the example of like a child, okay? A child goes to his father and tells him what he wants, okay? And the father is going to listen to what the child is saying, okay? But the, but, but the, the child should be willing to hear from the father that he cannot have what he wants, right? But that doesn't mean that the child isn't going to go ask. When a child goes and asks the father, the father might say yes, and the child will be joyful. Or he might say no and explain why. Maybe it's no. And even though the child doesn't like the answer, but he will accept it because he trusts the father. So also we should um, be able to receive from God either a yes or a no and trust that whether it's yes or whether it's no, it, it is the will of God but that shouldn't stop us from asking, shouldn't stop us from revealing to God what our desire is. Okay? That's all the time we have for today. And glory be to God forever. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, O Lord, for this day. We thank you for this time we have spent together. Guard us and keep us safe, your people, O Lord, and protect us and lead us to your heavenly kingdom. Through the prayers of St. Mary, Archangel Michael, St. Paul, St. Mark, and all your saints, hear us as we pray. Thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a good night.